Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Hudak. I'm a fellow in the Center for Effective Public Management and managing editor of the FixGov blog. I'd like to welcome all of you to the Brookings Institution today and to today's event, Governing from the Middle, a Common Sense Approach to Making Government Work for the American People. Uh, I'd like to thank C-SPAN for being here, and I'd like to invite everyone watching on our webcast to follow along on social media using hashtag SendMansion. It's no secret that the American government is in a period of serious dysfunction. Gridlock and polarization have crippled our elected institutions, trust in government has plummeted, and the public wants solutions, but all it seems to get is more and more problems. What's worse, it seems that too often our elected officials adapt to a dysfunctional system rather than trying to work in a way to reform it. And that's a serious problem. The result is a system that perpetuates ills rather than tries to find cures. Here at Brookings, through our political realism project, we are engaging a lot of scholars, both in-house and out-of-house, to try to look at the types of reforms that will help rejuvenate the system, get it back to work, get public policy moving in the right direction. It's a robust debate here at Brookings. Sometimes it's a divisive debate here at Brookings in-house. But it's one that we feel is vital to American democracy and to what the public expects from their government. Today, we're joined by a member of the United States Senate who's often engaged in similar types of debates with his own colleagues in his own institution. And we're pleased to welcome an additional voice in this discussion. Joe Manchin serves in the United States Senate and comes to Congress with a unique perspective. He's one of only 10 sitting United States senators who have formally served as governor. These 10 members bring a critical perspective. They're problem solvers. They were charged by their state to govern. They, their residents expected action. They oversaw state agencies, they oversaw crises, they oversaw a public that demanded a lot out of them, and their, the expectation was for them to deliver. Together, these 10 members have formed the former Governor's Caucus, a group committed to bringing their governing experience to bear in ways that reform not only public policy, but this new institution that they serve in, the United States Congress. Before I turn the podium over to the senator, I'd like to offer a bit of a brief introduction. Joe Manchin is now the senior senator from West Virginia, having been a senator since 2010. Previously, as I said, he served as governor from 2005 to 2010. And over the course of a more than 30-year career in public service, Senator Manchin served in the West Virginia House of Delegates, the State Senate, and as West Virginia's Secretary of State. It's my pleasure to Welcome, Senator Manchin, to Brookings. First of all, I want to thank Brookings for hosting this event today, but more importantly, for helping to tackle this important issue about how we can make government work better. And I want to thank you, John, uh, for the introduction and for your hard work on this effort, and all of the people here at Brookings. I know it's not sexy, and I know that certainly doesn't grab headlines like some of the divisive issues do, and when you operate from the fringes and the right and the left, it kind of gets people all fired up. But making government work more efficiently and effectively for the American people is so critical. It truly is to getting our country back on track. In 2010, when Senator Byrd passed away in June that, that, uh, that summer, I had to make one of the most difficult decisions of my political career. I had to decide. Uh, should I try to go to Washington and leave the office that I love being governor of the great state of West Virginia? I was two years into my second term in West Virginia. You're termed out two, four years. Uh, you're termed out and then you have to set out and you can come back maybe if the people would want you, but two, uh, two consecutive uh, terms. So I made the decision uh, and it was the toughest decision I made, but I made it on this premise. I felt like we had contributed so much. We brought people together. I never we had a super majority of Democrats in the state Senate and in the legislature. And I never would let the Democrats beat up on the Republicans. I said, guys, you know, by the grace of God, it could be us and we're going to need everybody working together. So we would work together. We would identify problems that we had for the state of West Virginia. We didn't make them political. It wasn't a political victory. If we did something, we did our job. And we took that premise and, and did everything in state that needed to be done. It was very critical. And when I made the decision, that I said, if I can take the experience I've had and the successes that we've been able to enjoy in West Virginia and bring that experience level to Washington, maybe I could be of some help 
I could contribute something. So I made the decision, and I felt good about what I left in the state and the job that we had done. So uh, I kept remembering Senator Byrd all the time would tell me about the way the Senate used to work. And of course, he was a master of the Senate, and he wrote the book. And he, uh, he truly uh, loved this place, and uh, he had the utmost respect for the U.S. Constitution and the tradition and procedure of the Senate, and we still abide by a lot of that. We have broken a few of his rules, which I'm sure would not favor too well with him. Uh, Senator Byrd served in the Senate at a time when it actually worked. When policy trumped politics and relationships were built to forge bonds of trust, not for political payback. When members sat down for a meal together and knew each other's families and their children and what they liked and disliked. Unfortunately, today in Washington, we live by the concept that you are no longer guilty by association. You're guilty by conversation today. If someone sees you talking to the opposite side or somebody that might not have your same thought process or philosophical belief, it's almost like you've gone to the dark side. And I said, my goodness, how can we learn what our differences are if we can't talk to each other and communicate and try to find a commonality? Gone are the days that senators of different parties break bread in the Senate dining room. I used to hear about that. We had that one dining room on the, the main dining room for the Senate, and we had the dining room on the left. The senators would go in there and have their meetings. Uh, when I first came here, uh, I said, my goodness, I don't know why they're not doing that anymore. It's something that we should do. Uh, they'll go the, tomorrow, Tuesday. Every Tuesday we have our caucus lunch. Tomorrow, both the Democrats and the Republicans will go their separate ways for lunches in two different parts of the Capitol. Uh, very seldom do we ever get together for a uh, bipartisan meal. Uh, so when you see us on C-SPAN, uh, on the floor, that's about the most time we spend with each other, is when you see us doing a vote on the floor, working back and forth and talking or going back and forth to committees because sometimes you know you might only serve with one member on one committee or another and you don't have all of them at one time. Um, I've tried to break that and we started a bipartisan, Senator Mark Kirk and myself when we first got here, started a bipartisan lunch and it has worked and we've been fairly successful at it. Uh, you can understand that most of the former governors are the ones that show up quite a bit because they understand that basically we have the same problems no matter what your state if you had an education problem, highway problem, Medicaid problem, we wanted to find out who had done something that worked and how could we do the same. And it was something we exchanged back and forth. I would call, I had no problem calling Mitt Romney when he was in Massachusetts or calling Rick Perry in, in Texas. No problem whatsoever. And we had great relationships. We are fortunate to have 10 former governors. We have five Democrats, one independent and four Republicans. We have Senator Warner, Senator Kane, Senator Carper, uh, Senator Alexander, Senator Hoven, Senator Shaheen, Senator Rounds, Senator Risch, and the independent is Senator King that, folk, that caucuses with the Democrats. We bring a more common sense approach to governing and while we don't get to meet as a group as much as we would like, uh, we naturally gravitate towards each other to make deals and work on common sense legislation. Um, when we ran our states, basically what we had to work, most of us had 46 states I believe have budget balance, uh, budget amendments balanced budget amendments. That means the first thing you want to know as governor, when you get elected and you get sworn in that day, they take you immediately and tell you and show you the revenue of the state and what you have to work with. And you have to start working on your budget and you work on the budget for the coming year and put things together. And basically, I would always say, what's the revenue? And every Tuesday afternoon, I would have the budget analysis and all my budget people would come and meet with the governor, meet with me, and they would tell me what our forecasts were or how our collections are going and how much we had to work with or areas we had to change and make adjustments. So that was something always cognizant on our mind. Can we pay for what we've promised or what we would like to do? So you start picking your priorities based on your values. What's the value of the people, my constituents in West Virginia? I knew exactly where we were. It was about our children getting a good start in life. It was about education and being able to attain an educational degree that gave you the skill sets to compete taking care of our veterans and taking care of our seniors. There were so many other things I couldn't do and people said, how'd you always balance the budget? I said, I said no more and I said yes. I said, I just couldn't do, I had to pick things and when they would come to me, everybody wanted all these things to be done. And I'd say, fine, here's what I've got to work with. Tell me which group of people you wanna go tell that we can't do that anymore. If I've picked one that's wasteful, then show it to me and we'll pick one that's more resourceful. So we had to make these decisions on revenue and balancing budgets. We are now trying 
to bring that same approach to the Senate and find common sense ways to accomplish a goal of making government work. And it's a challenge here because I can, I'll share this with you. The first day I was, uh, about the first day I came to the Senate, I said, what's our revenue? Well, I was told immediately we're going to spend about 3.5 to 3.7 trillion. I said, okay, how much money will we have? Well, we've looked at it every way possible. We don't think we can cut much out of the 3.5 or 3.7. I says, I got it. You want to spend $3.7 trillion. I got that. How much do you think we have to pay? Oh, we have about 2.2 in revenue. I said, you know, we're not high-end mathematicians back home, but we can't add and subtract. We figure you're about one and a half short. One and a half trillion short. Oh, it doesn't work that way in Washington. I haven't figured out this new math in Washington. I'm trying. I know that everyone's confused about this new math. I'm not. I'm having a hard time myself. Um, it, you know, we also had uh, uh, efficiencies of using taxpayer dollars. And I, I'll share another example as a governor what we did. Uh, this can be done through properly funding revenue positive offices. What's a revenue positive office? Revenue positive office is one uh, uh, that we would have that basically would do uh, budget reviews, general accounting offices, things of this sort that says if you do this, this, and this, you can save $100 billion. You can do this. You can save this. You have a redundancy in, in uh, government that these things have happened. Every president, like every governor comes in, has a, has a platform. And every legislature wants to, the first, the first honeymoon session, wants to give that new president or that new governor, basically uh, a honeymoon, if you will, and abide. So what we had is we had layer on top of layer adding up over the years. And every now and then you have to have a, a correction, and you have to change, and you have to consolidate, get rid of some that aren't working. No one's looking at that. It truly makes governing harder and actually hurts our country and our government when we don't do this. Most people don't realize that many offices in federal government, particularly offices of inspectors generals, can identify waste, fraud, and abuse inside and outside agencies. Um, perfect example for mine. When we used to have to cut back and they would tell me where revenue is going to be short in the state of West Virginia, I said, fine, show me where I'm making money. And they said, what? I said, show me where I have an agency that's returning more than we're investing into that agency. Perfect example, Department of Revenue. For all of my outside uh, auditors, I had outside and inside, inside the state and outside the state. For every dollar I spend on an outside audit, I get a $100 return. If I would just go and audit the company, because a lot of companies say, well, this is a kind of a gray line. We'll stop it right there. And if they say something, then we'll say it was an honest mistake because we read it and interpreted it differently. So you have to have auditors watching continuously. When we used to cut back budgets or had to flatline them, I would increase the outside auditor's budget because I knew they could help me get out of a hole quicker. It's common sense. It's no different than how you'd run your household or how you'd run your business. So uh, spending in these offices are often positive investments. So unfortunately, when we try to cut funding, we do it a net loss to our government, which we do it every day here. Um, when these offices experience funding cuts, the federal government actually loses money. And since we lose out on their ability to save money from other programs, that's why I will be introducing legislation to require the general accounting office to designate those federal offices that have saved more money than they have spent. I think it would be a, a, wide and an eye-opener for all of us if we knew that and that's again just common sense at governors we also looked at the bottom line we needed to know if the taxes we imposed actually helped or hurt we needed to know if we reduced taxes and accelerated the reduction if the revenue would catch up to it so we would watch it we put triggers in we would put triggers to stop and take a pause and see where we were uh, i always said there's certain things that people would do. First of all, if you're running out of money, the first thing that will happen, they'll rob the piggy bank. They'll sweep all the accounts and all the different agencies and basically so it's not noticeable to the average public. Then when that runs out, they'll make some cuts within government. They'll cut back and lay people off. And the last thing they would want to do, oh my God, they don't want to do this, is raise taxes because then somebody's messed up. That's what they believe. So basically what you have to do is look at the whole holistic approach to how you run the place and then you said well this we can afford this we can't afford this we'll eliminate this we won't this we will increase and basically or this we everybody's afraid to talk about taxes you wouldn't have, we can't even agree on the definition of revenue that's hard to believe 
If your revenue top rate is 39.6 and we reduce it to 33, you would think we cut the taxes, right? But if we got rid of all the junk in the box, all the giveaway, all the programs, and basically that every lobbyist in this town has been able to get a tax provision put in, an offset, every one of them for any of the special interest groups. So with all that being said, that's a tremendous draw on the revenue. But no one basically ever says, okay, how much did that cost? When you introduce something, how much is it going to cost me? And that's what we need to know. Uh, and that's what we're going to be working on. I focus to tackle comprehensive tax reform. There's no question I've been a big Bowl Simpson supporter. I thought the president missed golden opportunity to take that as his own in a bipartisan effort, tweak it the way he wanted to, but basically had a three-pronged approach to how we fix this. You fix your revenue, you can take care of anything. In your household, in your own daily life, in your businesses, if you get your revenue under control, you're in great shape. When you don't, you're behind eight ball. And my grandfather used to say, indebtedness that's unmanaged will make cowards out of the decisions you make. And they sure do. One area that we can immediately focus is adding transparency to our tax code. In many ways, tax expenditures have the same budgetary effect as spending increases. And while we all know about the mortgage interest tax deductions, the charitable tax deductions, corporate tax deductions, we don't always appreciate the cost of these tax expenditures. Uh, with full knowledge of the cost, we can start the process of overhauling our tax system, but do it in a calculated way so that we are not harming businesses or our own constituents. I will be introducing legislation to require Congress, OMB, that's the Office of Management Budget, CBO, Congressional Budget Office, to include tax expenditures in budget materials the same way that discretionary spending and mandatory spending are line items in the budget proposals and reviews today. They're going to have to take those the same as we do in our appropriations. As a former governor, I always wanted to know whether the actions we took were working and if we needed to amend or improve them. In Washington, it feels like everything that, I guess, when we do something, we think that it's exactly what needed to be done. We never acknowledge that we made a mistake. It didn't work. Uh, if that's the case, then why do you need us to come back every year? If we're that good at doing our job, then heck, we fixed everything. But if we didn't, then the reason I think our founding fathers had us coming back is to make adjustments. To make adjustments, you have to make admissions. I made a mistake. It didn't work out. The information I got was wrong. We're going to fix this. And that's all we're trying to say. In Washington, you know, it's, it's, it's no different than back home in West Virginia. And I've always told people, if I've got something wrong, I made a mistake, I can fix it. I sure didn't do it intentionally. I was doing it trying to make things better. But it didn't work out that way, so let's go back and correct it. Um, one way to address this is to reform our regulatory system. I will be introducing legislation also to reestablish the Office of Technology Assessment. Up until 1995, this office provided nonpartisan information to Congress on cost-benefit analysis of regulations and regulatory changes. Currently, the only source for this information is the White House's Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. This is not whether you're Democrat or Republican, but it shouldn't come from the White House's offices when it comes for us to make decisions in Congress. That's why we have three branches of government. Congress needs our own system for retrospective review of its existing rules and ways to identify available alternatives for various regulations. And there are already common sense bills out there that help us identify ways of our government can work more efficiently. Last Congress, I introduced a bipartisan, bicameral legislation to call Duplication Elimination Act to save billions of taxpayer dollars by making it easy, easier for Congress to eliminate duplication and overlap across the federal government. The bill would require the president to submit a proposal, proposed joint resolution to Congress each year on how to carry out recommendations outlined in the government's accountability office or the GAO. I'll give you an example. Some years it could be as much as three to four hundred billion dollars they recommend in savings and cuts and no duplication. We do nothing with this. Uh, within 90 days of the GAO's report released, the president must provide Congress with a draft proposal and a report that explains which GAO recommendations are excluded and why they are not included. More importantly, why, Mr. President, did you pick some that you didn't take the recommendation to consolidate or to eliminate? And give us your reasoning for doing that. Make it transparent so we understand. We think that would work very well. Both chambers of Congress must vote on proposals within 10 days and any savings achieved, any dollars achieved through the Duplication Elimination Act must be used for deficit reduction. We're making no attempt at all. No one seems to be worried about an $18 trillion deficit. 
So we've got to start earmarking dollars for that. This is a win-win bill. It only gets rid of government waste, but it also holds our government accountable for unnecessary, unnecessarily and unacceptable redundancies. Now I know these fixes won't change all the dysfunction, but it's a start. We are starting to see a glimmer of hope, and it is the one reason I've decided to stay in the Senate and not return back to home to West Virginia. If it was about personal politics and not public politics, I'd be out of here. I would be out the first to tell you that. Uh, there's no place like home. Now, with that being said, public public offices and, and public uh, public service is truly what it what it refers to. It's public, and I looked at it from the standpoint. I don't have the same feeling if I would leave the day and go back and try to be governor again. I don't have the same feeling I left when I left governor to come here. I felt like I accomplished something back home. I left the, I left the state in better shape than I received it. I don't feel that I've accomplished enough here. I see the changes, but I don't feel good enough that I've actually done something. So I think there's more to be done. Uh, I feel like we can make a difference, and we are making more of a difference. We're having more bipartisan talks. We're debating legislation and working on amendments, and I feel like there's more work to know to do. I know the campaign season is ramping up and we will likely see negative ads coming from all over and the political knives coming out as sharp, sharper than ever. I'm hopeful that some of my colleagues will join me in a pledge that I have taken. This is a pledge I took, me personally. I love to see a pledge everybody sign up. I took a pledge when I first, they said, Joe, why does the place not work? And I said, well, let me give you the scenario here. Human nature is this. It's hard to say no to your friends. It's truly hard. Now, with that, we have no relationships, so you don't have many friendships. From the standpoint, that's my friend, I, I, I'll work with you. So I said, on top of that, every day I come to work, they expect me to go make phone calls and raise money so that money can be spent against my colleague. I'm a Democrat, they expect every penny I raise to be used against a Republican. They expect me to even go on the trail and campaign against a Republican. They expect all my Republican colleagues and friends to do the same against me. Now, how in the world on Monday can you come to me and say, hey, Joe, let's sit down and work on this. I really have a good idea here. When I know last week you raised money, you spent money on ads against me, and you went to my home state and told people they shouldn't vote for me. What, what makes you think I'm going to want to sit down with you on Monday and work something out? Does it make sense? So I took a pledge. I will not raise a dollar, and I will not campaign against any colleague. I will not, no matter whether we agree or disagree. I think it makes a horrible atmosphere and a horrible situation that we live with up there. And if you want to know why we're so dysfunctional, why we don't get along, it's because everybody's afraid to talk. Guilt by conversation. They're afraid to talk and tell them exactly what you're working on because it could be used against them in an ad. They could see whatever they talk about come up in an ad against them. That's one pledge I like to see this whole town engage into. We cannot campaign. It used to be an unwritten pledge. I heard that nobody campaigned against each other before, but boy, that's not the case anymore. So that's what I'm joining. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, there is not one colleague of mine, even the ones I disagree with, who I can't work with, and there's not one colleague can look at me and say, Joe Manchin's trying to defeat me and take my job away. Not one. So it makes it pretty easy for me to cross over the aisle and work with them. And uh, I always tell them I'm the bellwether person there. They bring it to me. <laughs> And I tell them, I said, well, let me talk to some of my colleagues and see if it's something they can agree on. And then we start moving from there. But we try to find that commonality. And the governor's caucus is one that we work very closely with. Um, I don't believe this place is working as Senator Byrd used to tell me it did. But I, I've got to commit to you. I'm not going to stop fighting. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's well worth the fight that we have in us to make this place work. We've had a lot of other challenges that have been greater than this for our country. And we've overcome them all. And I think we can overcome this one, too. So I want to thank you all, and I appreciate it. And I guess we're going to have some questions now. Thank you. listen to me, Senator Manchin, <laughs> and, and Senator Byrd was on my mind because you are so much. Roll over too. Yeah, right. Um, we've been talking to Senator Manchin's staff for some months now about the interesting and valuable perspective that former governors bring to the work of the United States Senate. 
Um, one of our Brookings advisors here is former Governor Voinovich from Ohio. We were just on the phone with him the other day. He was thrilled to hear that you're doing this. He was a former governor, a former mayor, and a senator. And when he left the Senate, we lost a champion for sensible government reform in the Senate. So um, I'm very proud to see Senator Manchin stepping into that role today at, with his other former governors, both Democrats and Republicans. And I must say I'm very impressed with the reform agenda he has outlined here. From process agendas like returning to bipartisan lunches and the Governor's Caucus itself, to substantive reforms like including tax expenditures in the budget process, something that we have talked about in the think tank world for a long time and it, it needs to be something people are grappling with politically. Um, to the return of the Office of Technology Assessment, one of the one of the few truly valuable small, I think the whole thing had 90 people in it or something, small pieces of government that was well worth its weight and somehow has got chopped. Um, and so I'd like to open, Senator, by asking you a sort of general question. Why is it so hard to get the United States Congress interested in these common sense, nonpartisan reform issues? Well, as I said in the speech, they're not sexy. It's not something that makes you want to go out and vote or makes you want to write a check to help somebody. And right now, they're chasing the almighty dollar in the vote, wherever it may be. And there's a never-ending cycle. I mean, everyone's in cycle all the time. Whether it's a six-year cycle that we're in as far as in Senate, a two-year cycle for Congress, a four-year cycle for President, everyone seems to be in election cycle. So if, if you notice, when people say outrageous things, um, and people of, of responsibility that you would think that that doesn't make any sense at all. Why would you say that? There's, the country is so divided with the 24 news, 24 seven news cycle that we're, we're, we're on overload. And people are, don't know what to believe. Paranoia is just ran, running rampant. And man, they get all fired up. And, they, and I get people talking to me about stuff. You know, the last thing I heard about is was special forces are going to take over Texas. <laughs> Remember that one? Yeah. And I, didn't, I couldn't believe when I heard that. And I says, what? And they said, well, we've got to have the National Guard in Texas watching the United States government special forces come in and do training, which they've been doing for quite some time. And I just kind of nonchalantly said, well, you know what? If you're that worried in Texas about the federal government and the special forces, we'll take them all in West Virginia because we still trust them. <laughs> but this is what it's gotten to. Mm -hmm. So how do you get out of that? Uh, I don't know. I mean... I can honestly tell you, I don't think Citizens United did us any favor for our, for our country. That we're individuals now, when they talk about a very wealthy individual, he might be having his own primary. They're all catering to this one individual to see if that's where his super PAC money's gonna go. That's not how, you know how we do it. That's not how we do it back home in West Virginia, but uh, we don't have anybody that wealthy to go after. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, if we did, it wouldn't be the right thing. We still have limits of $1,000. No corporations, $1,000 is the maximum you can give to any candidate. And I think it works pretty well. Good. Um, let, let's go to tax reform for a minute. I mean, this whole notion of tax expenditures for, you know, many of you in this room, I'm sure know that over the last several decades, the as the um, discretionary part of the budget has kind of shrunk as a proportion of the whole, what we've done is we've legislated via tax expenditures, and the tax expenditures have gone way up, obviously, because then you, somebody can go home and they can say, well, we gave you this, but it's, we didn't increase government spending. So tax expenditures are obviously very seductive to politicians. Um, do you think we can break that habit? It's, it was such a, it, it sort of snuck in there almost with no one, you know, they snuck up almost with no one knowing what was happening. Oh, they, there were people who knew what was happening. <laughs> it's just not the general public. Let me just tell you, when I said we can't even agree on the definition of revenue, let me tell you what I was meaning by that. I talk to my friends all the time, and I, when, as a governor, the first thing you look at as, a business, as an individual, 
You, you do a budget. You know what, how much money you got coming in. You know how much you can spend. You know what your fixed costs are. You know what your variables are. And you know what you have to play with. And you try to stay within that balance. Uh, so we do the same here. So we got to the point. Erskine Bowles in 1997 basically was the author of writing for working with the Republican Congress at that time under, Senator, uh, under President Clinton and put a budget together and a tax reform uh, that basically put us on a path uh, of, I think, of solvency. I mean, if we would have stayed under the Clinton tax code, t tax rates, we'd have been totally tax debt free as a nation by 2012. By 2012, we had two tax cuts that came, we had two wars unfunded, and it just started pummeling from there. And I tell Democrats, if, if you want to blame, blame, blame Republicans, go right ahead, they're at fault. I tell Republicans, you want to blame the Democrats? Go ahead. We're at fault. We've all added to this. Now, how do you fix it? Because we can't. So when you can't agree on revenue, that means if you get a tax code, and this is where Bowles Simpson took a balanced approach, three-pronged approach, revenue, expenditure, and reform. You have to look at everything. And everybody has to take a little bit of a haircut to get this thing back in place. But no one's willing to sacrifice a vote for that or a bad, uh, a bad ad on TV against you. And I think what we ought to do is get a bunch of senators who are thinking about retiring, who could care less about getting reelected and say, listen, we'll be sacrificed. We'll sacrifice ourselves. And we'll be the ones that will fix this thing for the next generation. Because we've done tax reform about every 17 years. We haven't done major tax reform since 1986. So I tell my Republican friends who've taken a no new tax pledge, I says, I understand. It's going to be hard for you, anything we do. How are we going to pay down 18 trillion if we don't have revenue? You got to spend off revenue. So if I reduce the tax of 39 to 33, corporate from 35 to 25, 26, 27, but I get rid of a lot of the junk in the box, a lot of the credits, a lot of the offsets, a lot of the goodies that you all have had written in over the years, those go away. And at the end of the day, we spin off a trillion dollars. You're going to have dynamic growth. Dynamic growth is going to happen. You know when it happens? When you have confidence there's a fair system. When you know the system's fair, and you know you're treated fair, the sky's the limit because then you have confidence and you'll do things. Uh, so with that being said, how do you spend the trillion? So I talked to my Republican friends. I said, why don't you take this position? We have a, we have a, well, we have a global competitive rate in personal and corporations. Okay, they can't hide money, can't go offshore. Got to pay here. So we do that. And now we got money coming in. Even though we reduced the rate. Now you're going to have a few of your friends are saying, yeah, you know what? My rate was at 39.6, but I had a lot of offsets. I'm paying more now at 33, and I was at 39.6. That could be true to some. But with that being said, let me tell you how I made the Democrats spend it if you're a Republican. 60 cents of every new dollar that came in went to debt reduction. That'll continue until we get to 65% of debt to GDP, which is manageable, which is what all of the economists tell you is manageable. The other... 40 cents of every dollar goes to an infrastructure bank. Only can be used for infrastructure in the United States of America. Nowhere else. That's it. So you rebuild America, you've got a cash flow into a bank. That's an 80-20 match coming off of that. And the 60 cents of every new dollar goes into debt reduction. So the Republicans have held the Democrats' feet to the fire. You can expand, basically, the entitlement programs. And we were able to, as Democrats, put a fair system in and we were able to dedicate towards getting rid of our debt. And you could have a balanced budget 10, 15 years. That's why, I mean, that's, uh, I talked to him, I said, can you go home and defend yourself? Oh, I think I can. I said, well, <laughs> let's try it then. Let's do something. <laughs> that's but great. I step that far over the line. <laughs> it remind, when you talk about retiring senators, it reminds me of the famous movie of Abe Lincoln that was just out a couple years ago, where when he was counting up votes to pass the 13th Amendment, what was the first thing he did is he found everybody was getting ready to retire. <laughs> and, and, a lot more courage then. That's right, a lot more courage then. Um, uh, we've got a great audience here. Um, a couple questions. We have time before the senator leaves. Let's see. Yeah, right there. Right here. Uh, yeah. Say who you are, please. 
My name is Graham Vise. I'm with the Policy News website Inside Sources. Um, Senator, last week Mayor Bill de Blasio came to Washington and outlined a very different policy agenda than the one uh, you just uh, outlined. He called for a $15 minimum wage, paid sick leave, uh, closing the carried interest loophole. Why are he and senators like Elizabeth Warren wrong to advocate a more progressive or liberal agenda? And uh, what do you think is the future of the Democratic Party if it goes down that path? They're not wrong. First of all, carry interest loophole is the biggest loophole we have. There's not even a hedge fund person who benefits from it, even today, will defend it. So it should be done away with. Uh, so we agree on that. And the $15, you know, this minimum wage, uh, I, you know, minimum, I'm, I'm for raising minimum wage. I think it should be indexed. I think a lot of things should be indexed once we get them back to where they should be. But minimum wage, from the standpoint, is not going to raise the middle class. You know, we're not going to be able to. We're ready to pass one of the largest trade deals, one of the largest trade deals in the history of this country. If we do that without looking at what we're doing and understanding what's happened to us, and all, hindsight's 2020, go back to 1992 when NAFTA came in. My little state of West Virginia has lost 31,000 jobs since NAFTA. It's hard for me to go home and say, guess what, this is going to be different. So much better for you. You know, and if you look at where a lot of our jobs were lost, was in the inner cities. We had a lot of a textile, we had a lot of things going on. We've lost all that. Now it's become rampant with crime, high unemployment. So how are we better off? So we need to look at that. Now, if minimum wage is what they think is the only way we can raise, you know, uh, any type of quality of life, we're in trouble. Uh, the other thing is, is that uh, no one, you haven't heard anybody on the campaign trail talk about drug abuse, have you? It's not sexy. You know why it's almost as, there's not one of us sitting in this room doesn't know someone in our immediate family or extended family that hasn't had a prescription drug problem. It is rampant. It is an epidemic proportion. We can't find people that are clean enough to work. We, we're, our, our education is not pushing them to get skill sets where they can compete globally. There's a lot going on there. So I know these, I'm fine. I can, I can look at a progressive and I can look at a very conservative. And, but somewhere in between, you've got to, you know, I said this, I'm not right on every issue, but I'm not wrong on every issue. I've got something to contribute. And when Mary de Blasio came, God bless him. I'm, we want to hear all your ideas, uh, you know. And uh, Elizabeth Warren's a good friend of mine, and we've teamed up on a lot of amendments together, you know, and trying to put some balance to this thing. But on the other hand, you can't chastise everybody that's out there investing and out there trying to get a return on investment that's out there willing to take a risk. Uh, and we just got to make sure that we can continue for this, uh, for this system of ours, this uh, unbelievable system of ours. The economy we have is $18 trillion. Closest one to is China, $10 trillion. Everything falls off from there. Everything falls off from there. Nobody rises above $5 trillion after that. So it tells you. So we are the big people. We are the superpower. We have a super economy. People want in this marketplace. But we should protect some of the jobs we have here and grow some jobs. That's the problem. So I, I don't, you know, it's a lot of things I will agree and a lot of things I might disagree, but I'm always trying to find the balance because I've been able to talk to the people from the far left and the far right and, and tell them, I said, it sounds good, but doesn't make sense. I can't sell it back home. Let's see, um, right here? Yeah, right, uh, right here. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Well, we'll, okay, we'll, we'll get right there, buddy. <laughs> hey, how are you? I'm John. I'm just here by myself. So uh, I was wondering uh, kind of how you see the trend of your state over the long term. I've noticed in previous election cycles, it's gone very hard to the right. And I know lots of that is probably in reaction to Obama. And I was wondering, do you see things improving maybe after Obama? Uh, and then also... Uh, I, I would like to hear you, your thoughts on Mr. Justice, who's going to run for, yeah. First of all, my state has. Since uh, Bill Clinton was the last presidential uh, candidate uh, to win uh, as a Democrat in West Virginia, uh, we've gone, states kept going progressively Republican since then, even though we still have about 62% of all citizens registered Democrats. You would think with that many registered Democrats. But, you know, I tell them, in, we're a little different Democrats in West Virginia. You know, it's a, it's a, uh, I try to describe myself. I tell people, I says, uh, I'm fiscally responsible and socially compassionate. But I think that's most people, whether you're Democrat or Republican, that kind of 
gra gra gathers a lot of people in that arena. With that being said, uh, social our social agenda basically is much more conservative than the National Democrat agenda. And with that, we have to be able to articulate that a little bit uh, clearer uh, as that. Uh, Jim Justice is a, he was a Republican, just turned Democrat to run for governor. And, but Jim's been Republican, Democrat. Jim, Jim is one of those guys that crosses over. He's a, he's a great person. He's created a lot of jobs. And he'll be a job creator. He thinks out, outside the box. So that would be good. Uh, the Democratic uh, voters need to be looking more at the candidate. Now, uh, President Obama brought in a climate agenda that, that we differ with. And, and, and it's not because we don't want a clean, we want a clean climate. We want clean air and clean water and all that. But there's a balance between the environment and economy. Uh, and the only thing I've said, if it's not obtainable, it's not reasonable. He's put some things in play here that we don't have technology in place. If the federal government wants to invest and find the technology that does a certain thing, and then you decide you're not going to do it because it costs too much, I'm sorry, you're out of business. If the technology hasn't been developed and you're doing everything you can to the best of what's available, then we shouldn't push you out because we just don't like what you're doing. And that's what's happening. So when a coal miner and a family lose an $80,000 job and all they got looking in, in the face is a service job for twenty, twenty-five thousand, dollars this is personal. And it's got deep seat and it's got... There's, there's just deep animosity towards the president and his policies. And all the Democrats are suffering from it. Let, let me ask the senator something I've been thinking about since you brought up this revenue positive jobs or offices, because it's very interesting. I wonder how your Republican colleagues will feel about this. If you, if you do, in fact, go identify these, the argument then is made that for every, say, Medicaid or Medicare fraud investigator, we ought to hire more. It actually would be an argument for increasing the federal workforce, which of course the Republicans seem to you know, be completely allergic to. So do you think that, that if in fact you could prove uh, that there were in fact revenue positive offices, you would get some momentum for uh, helping them bring in more money? Well, I would like to think that they would look at it uh, that way. I would sure try and I sure would think that they would accept it. But you know, it makes sense that if we can show you that rather than changing the whole makeup of Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, reform it. President Clinton, um, President Clinton reformed Medicaid reform, mm -hmm. which helped it send a positive message that, you know, five years and you're out, you have to find a job. We're not rehabilitating anybody. The thing, the, the, the culture of America is we don't seem to want to hold you responsible or accountable. You know, we give you something, and if it doesn't work, we'll give you twice as much. <laughs> it's not like, um, why didn't it work? What did you not do? Why didn't you go to your doctor's visits? When I was governor, I asked for a waiver, a Medicaid waiver, because I just couldn't keep up with the cost of Medicaid. And I had a lot of people that needed help. And I went and told the federal government, you should not make me take care of a healthy poor person the way I think I have a moral responsibility to take care of a sick poor person. That sick poor person has very little options. The healthy person, if I can get them back in the work stream and, and mainstream, they can pretty take care of get back off their, off their feet, on their feet and go back and do something. So I said, I call what we call mountain, mountain choices, rewards. I rewarded you because, you know, pain and suffering for dental and for eye care. And I said, if you went to your doctor's visit and not go to the emergency room, if you join a, a healthy choice, a healthy lifestyle, uh, ate properly, and you exercised, and you did things you were, I'd have you ready to go back into the workforce. Federal government fought me tooth and nail against that type of a <laughs> responsible, reasonable approach. And it just makes sense. So if we can't hold people accountable and responsible, I would tell my Republican friends, let us try. I said, before you want to privatize this or that, you can't privatize, you know, uh, Social Security or Medicare. And I'm 65, 70 years old. Now you want me to go out and make my best deal. My negotiating days are probably over by then. I'm not as good a negotiator <laughs> as maybe I was a little while ago. So don't put me in that position because I'm going to get hurt. And that's just a, just a, just a humanistic approach to some of these things uh, doesn't even ring true. So we keep looking for <clears throat> fraud, Social Security. We've got more people signing up for this total disability than ever before. And there's people that know. I can go anywhere in the country 
You know somebody's receiving a government check that you don't think should be? Oh, everybody raises their hand. Yeah, I know somebody. <laughs> I know somebody. How come we're not, re why don't we be checking? Why don't we make them come back to reevaluate if they're still totally disabled? You know, you're getting a lifetime award, lifetime check. That's the jackpot. You've done hit the lottery. And those types of things, you know, we need to look at that. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, s w tell me why on, so on Social Security that we've capped it at 110, was it 112 now? We're capped about 112. 112 yeah. All we have to do is get that up to where, you know, the average of two or 250,000 and index it from there. And that we have cash flow that'll keep us going for quite some time. That's not offensive. You know, as a senator and congressman, we make 174. So at 174,000, we're, you can see our pay changes about seven, eight months into it. Well, seven or eight months, I've already learned how to live off what I was getting for the six or seven months. <laughs> So it wouldn't hurt me to keep, keep taking that out. I mean, that just makes sense. And, and you know, we talk about these things, and people just have a hard time understanding it. And uh, uh, I've talked about, and I threw this out. Social Security, they talk about COLAs, cost of living increases. Now, let me tell you, there's some people that have to have a cost of living increase because it's all they've got. And there's other people that might not. My parents didn't need the cost of living increase. My parents would have been fine with no cola. My aunt wouldn't have been fine without a cola. She needed that cola. So, so you start thinking, okay, in, in real world, how do you make this work? Do you say anybody that has income of greater than 250 or even 300% of the poverty guidelines, might be 60, 70,000, so should they be exempt from getting the cola? No one's gonna get exempt from getting their social security. You're gonna get your social security check. But if you're below a certain level, you get the coal. If you're above, you might. Because we've gotten all this other stuff, uh, you know, all the fights and arguments going on uh, with uh, the colas, and no one's having the real, real heart discussions on this stuff. Yes. I think we owe her right there. Yeah, right there. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Sharon Bovat, voice of a moderate. Last Wednesday, Ross Rowland had a coincidental meeting with me. He's the train legend that did the American um, Freedom Train in the Bicentennial. He was Reagan's appointment, and he basically said that our coincidental meeting was um, God's way of acting anonymously, because there are Republicans that want to fund Amtrak infrastructure, and they're scared. I mean, they're actually nervous and so there are people that are experts that are both parties that want to help uh, provide information to the senate and the congress but what avenue would they go to is there like a list of politicians that'll be open to hearing from a bipartisan coalition that would like to well uh, what we'll do on that anytime you have somebody that wants to get a point across and really has something Look at the committee that it basically would adhere to. So if it's commerce, that could, that's probably commerce committee. Get a senator, myself, I'm on commerce, anybody, to ask them if they can present at a public hearing. They can come to a public hearing or come to a subcommittee hearing. They can get their point across much better that way and see if it's worthwhile than trying to run the halls and find a couple people sympathetic towards them. So I would recommend them coming to any committee member and asked to be on a subcommittee panel to present their views. That'd be the best way. Great. Senator, thank you so much. Um, you have laid out a, a pretty amazing reform agenda here today. <laughs> I'm hoping that the former governor's caucus is going to become a real force in the United States Senate. And remember, it is a bipartisan caucus because there's some Republican former governors as well as Democrats. And therefore, those of us at Brookings um, are at your disposal to help you make uh, government as good as it can possibly be. Let me just say at Brookings, you all have, we have used you quite extensively. And I think that all of us, Democrats and Republicans, look at to find that common sense and that middle of the road, if you will. Uh, it's going to have to be people speaking out, uh, I mean, before we hit the proverbial wall. And, and the financial wall is the one I'm concerned about. Uh, you know, Wall Street, can't be doing this tremendous when everyone else is not feeling, getting the bump that they should be getting out of it. And before long, people will lose confidence. When you lose confidence, you'll see a big switch. And when that switch happens, you see a lot of people that are very reluctant and very scared. 
And when that happens, then you have serious problems on your hands as we did in 2007. So we're watching it very closely and, and we're gonna be involved, but I encourage all of you, keep involved with our offices, follow us, and all of us have web pages and your comments, that's another way, web pages are another way to get to us. Uh, our staff monitors that and gets it right, any of the uh, any concerns that you might have and some great ideas that we get from you all. It's still government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And the last time I checked, it wasn't just us on Congress, it was all of you all. So stay involved, thank you. Thank you, Senator.